when I went to the first grade of school, this one room schoolhouse just across the road up here. Uh, there was a big chestnut tree up on the hill and at dinner at uh, recess the teacher would let us go up on the to that chestnut tree and when they were green the birds were still hanging on the trees, you know. And uh, the bigger boys or bigger girls would use sticks or whatever and knock the chestnuts off. And we kind of judged the uh, tough boys by the ones that could bust the heel and the uh, birds open with their heel, you know, and barefoot. And us children, the little ones, would have to get us a rock and bust them. Sometimes they'd bust them for us. And I was about six years old. I know uh, I had a very good, very nice decision. My mama's first cousin got his eye put out. He looked up and one fell, he'd been eye, he put his eye out. Evidently, it didn't put his eye out right on the spot, but he finally went blind. Had to, had to take the eye out of the infection. And after all that, it, uh, he went in service in 41. He stayed in there all through the war one eye. Took him right on. He thought, well, they won't take me. They did take him. I put a chestnut bird, about a half of one, and under a no feller's horse collar pad one time. Boy, he spoke to that horse and hit with the pull and get that, and hit come right back, you know, and it tried it again. The bird sticking it, you know, and hit went right down on its rear end and it started kick. <laughs> Tore his sled off. He run away, you <laughs> know. And they uh, used a lot of the bark sometimes. They had tan bark and they used the bark off of it for tan bark. And when the blight hit it, uh, of course, people didn't know what was happening to them, you know, they were dying. And when they died, they cut them down and uh, cut them up in 10 foot length so they could use them for rail. That's what a rail was back in 10 foot. They split them open. They were split easy, the ones that were uh, long bodied and didn't have any knots on them. By, they would split easy, and they split them out in rails. Yeah, people would build big grill fences and and uh, around their corn fields, and people made liquor and everything, and they'd burn the whole fence up, getting them dry chests to run that liquor off with, you know. I've seen my dad go to the top of that hill right yonder in the big snow on the ground. He'd cut him a big chest and trim it up, turn it loose out of that mountain and he'd be just like a black snake come all the way into the line fork down there, buddy. They'd have a, they had saw like 10 foot long and if it got more than what it wouldn't go through, they would tie a piece of wire on the saw and pull it back through, push it. They couldn't push it, but they could pull it back and the other guy could pull it back to him. But when I got bigger, my granddaddy let me cut them up into dye wood. So they used that, that wood for dye wood. And uh, I had, we had a little pair of mules here, and I would get somebody to help me, and we'd cut those 10 foot lengths in two and split it. Had to be split dye wood then. And I hauled it out here to Kimmings, it's about, oh, about eight miles out here with a pair of mules. And I'd haul it out there and send it. Seemed me like a load would bring me about four and a half to five and a half dollars little load on the wagon with two mules that I could drive, you know. Mm -hmm. well, they were playing in Nashville. They made, they caught, made some kind of dye. And what kind of dye they made, I, I don't know. But that's where they all went. They bust, they bust them up. They busted real easy. You take a slit, have them bust one year old. Split up the way you want And that's where they all went. When they, when they got them all cut down in here, that plant went out of business. But now, what kind of dye they made, I don't know. Oh, about that. My daddy worked there five years. When I was in high school, it started in 1946. The, uh, there's a railroad spur not too far from where I live in Shelbyville. And it, uh, I had to go by that going to school every day. And when I started school, they were 
loading logs on there from Chestnut Ridge. That's uh, between Shelbyville and Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. And they were hauling that, those logs continuously into that railroad spur and loading them on rail cars and, and shipping them, from what I heard, to North Carolina where they would, were storing them in warehouses for furniture manufacture. And I think one of the popular types of furniture was uh, wormy chestnut, they called it. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, when chestnut uh, dies, uh, the worms burrow into it, and so you get these little worm trails that go through it. And chestnut being so rot resistant, uh, in the, uh, even after the chestnut black came through, which uh, it would have begun here, this part of Tennessee and, and southern Kentucky, somewhere in probably the late 1920s. Uh, by the late 1930s, the chestnut trees were pretty much dead, but still standing. And so people continued to log chestnut on into the 1960s. It's so rot resistant. And so you saw that up after the, the worms have had a chance to, to make their little worm holes through it. And, and that's what you get. Uh, and it adds character to the wood. It's, uh, it makes it a very beautiful kind of wood. Uh, and of course, uh, I mean, you have to accept it for what it is because that's what you get is wormy chestnut. What's happened is, uh, as time's gone on, it was, I guess, just decided by someone, I don't know who really started, but to try to do the research to see if we can uh, restore some because what they found happening is that the root systems were not bothered by the blight. It went down to the to the ground and they, then they would sprout up. Um, they're not extinct because they survive. In fact, look, here's a blight killed tree right here. This one got chestnut blight and died back um, to the ground and that has sprouted from the base. Even if you walk in the woods, the American chestnuts that were killed by the blight, they some of them have kept coming back from the roots because the fungus only eats the bark. Now that little yeah. cap had come up from the ground, yeah. and it had to come up from a Speak green up. root. There had to be some. Speak up. And it stood there in the yard, he got about all the bigger snow pipe up, 30 foot high before it died. That, that the tree right back up here, that's uh, an oak tree. And when Craddock went up there with me, he saw that tree and he said, well, this is why we can never hope that the American chestnut is going to come back and restore itself. Because that's what a lot of people thought. After all the trees die, then the blight will die because it has no host tree. Mm -hmm. But he found that and he said, well, we see now that that tree is a host tree. So that blight, the blight's not going to kill it. It's going to make it mess it up pretty good, but it's not going to kill it. So, you know, we don't have any hope of having restored just by itself, nature restoring it. So what we're doing is we're breeding chestnuts for blight resistance. It turns out that the Asian species, Chinese chestnut and Japanese chestnut, have genetic resistance to the fungus. Mm -hmm. It lives on their bark. It might cause a symptom, but it usually doesn't kill the tree. And if we make a hybrid between the American and the Chinese chestnut, um, some of those offspring inherit the disease resistance from their Chinese parent. Mm -hmm. And if we breed those hybrids back to the American chestnut, we can dilute the Chinese gene so that the trees look more and more American. Mm -hmm. um, not because we don't like the Chinese chestnuts. Chinese chestnuts are wonderful, but they don't grow very well here in the mm -hmm. forest. We need a tree that grows like an American chestnut. I mean, we're 87 and a half percent genetically American. Uh, we have some that would be uh, 92, 94 percent American. So we're getting down toward that. I mean, ultimately about 15, 16 is, is what we're aiming for. Uh, phenotypically, uh, they even the ones at this stage look look pretty American. You, it's pretty hard to find any Chinese traits uh, in them other than the black resistance, and that's of course what we're aiming for. This is where we inoculated the tree with chestnut blight. And had the tree been susceptible, it would have just died. This tree is responding to chestnut blight by growing this thick callus. This is actually wound tissue. So this tree has chestnut blight all the way from the ground up. Can you see the swellings here on the bark? This swollen cracked bark, that's a symptom of chestnut blight. So this tree has chestnut blight but it hasn't died because it has genetic resistance that it inherited from its Chinese ancestor.